Welcome, everyone, to Midday Magazine for this December 1st, 2023. Have your host, James J. Mailoff, here at 3.30. We're going to welcome our friends from Wisconsin Rapids Community Theater. Get a preview of A Candle in the Window, their holiday play coming up. Right now, joining us on the phone, our friend, Wisconsin State Assembly District 72 Representative Scott Krug. Scott, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you today? Doing good. It's been a while. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk last month, so um, uh, it's, it's good to have you here with us. I uh, I got stuck in the in the Capitol on a Friday, which never happens. Uh, last <laughs> month we were getting ready to get our twenty three election bills ready for the floor session that week. So I had basically held an open office hours for anybody that wanted to come amend anything that day, and just got caught up in in work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, understand. Hey, the day job comes first, man. That's understandable. Uh, I'm curious, how did that go? It was great. I, I don't think in my 13 years down there that we've ever had a a whole day for one topic on the floor. So we had 20 bills, three constitutional amendments. Uh, we went through that entire docket of bills in maybe five or six hours, which in any other given time, if you didn't work bipartisanly, would take 13 to 16 hours. I mean, it was just it was great. It was a good example of what happens when you can sit down with each other and listen and work through things and know that you're not going to agree on all of them, but most of them. So just all of that work made it an easy day, actually. You know, um, certainly one of the things that uh, I don't have to tell you, you deal and your colleagues deal with is the idea that uh, we, we want more done from our politicians. We want more bills passed, we want more things done, more, more, more. Um, so I don't know if this counters that or not, but do you think we need more of that, Scott? Well, uh, more of what you experienced through that? Yeah, I think I think we need more conversation. I'm always one that likes to say, you know, I, I actually like working in a split government, right? Because only the best bills get done. Because when you have just one party controlling everything, you just kind of throw everything at the wall and it all gets through. And then I always tell people that, you know, every time we pass a bill, there's always unintended consequences. So it seems like when we pass bills and become laws, we almost create another problem somewhere else. So it's Nice not to have too many bills, but it's nice to have a lot of conversation to make good bills. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scott, if you don't mind, as I mentioned, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk last month, so I-, I would like to rewind a little bit with you and talk about some of the events of November, especially so many of them being very noteworthy. Um, the Committee on Campaigns and Elections, you-, you-, you met with members of the committee, you met two times uh, in November. Can you tell us what you guys discussed and how that went? Yeah, I think the the biggest one, the biggest takeaway, I think, is something we've been working on for about four years now, and this was the Monday processing of absentee ballots. So the way that Wisconsin counts its ballots has led to a lot of confusion over the last few elections, where we've got so many numbers of absentee ballots, and it's growing and growing every year because people are appreciating the ability to absentee vote. But Wisconsin doesn't process them, but, you know, open them, count them, register them, mark them in the election book, give them serial numbers, all that processing doesn't happen until election day. So when there's gobs and gobs and gobs of absentee ballots, it takes them all day in bigger cities to get counted. Some people tend to think that at the end of the day, when there's a dump of 200,000 votes into the tally, that new ballots were found somewhere or that there was some fraud going on because where did all these ballots come from? What do they what? think? This yeah. is Chicago? Come on. I, I, right. I, can, make yeah. right. I can make that joke. I can make that joke. Right. <laughs> and that, that's exactly what it is. It's all these absentee ballots that if like 38 other states process them ahead of time mm-hmm. so they can just count them on election day, right? I, I don't so want to make light of in election integrity by any means, uh, but I, it is getting to a point where it... I don't, I don't think it's ever silly to question these things or to question government. I encourage people to do that. I think that's important. I also think it's important to be an adult, and once you get answers, uh, that, that you, you need to move on as a society. We have people out there that are still, that are, are still barking about the last presidential election and everything. So I, 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 uh, do you think that with more and more of this being done, that we get away from more and more of that? And there's, yes, there, people believe in the election system more and more. That is exactly the whole point of this bill in particular is that I've said from the beginning when I took on this job as the chairman of that committee that 90% of our problem can be solved by this bill becoming law 
where we've got the results that are available to people in this instant need for information society. People want to know right away who won. We need to know on election day, not the day after, not three days after. We need to know on election day. But we've also got to do it right. So we can't just do speed. we got to be accurate. So mm -hmm. letting this process start a day earlier so everything is ready to go on election day. So by 10 o'clock on election night, for example, we can have a great idea who won an election before we all go to bed. So nobody wakes up in the morning and say, hey, my guy was winning and now he lost overnight. Something had to have happened. Mm. I, I get where people can get that perception from. I'm not, I'm not blind to where that perception can come from. But I also want to make sure people understand that this can be fixed pretty easily, like 40 other states have done already. So it's just it's a great example, and Republicans and Democrats worked really hard together on this bill. We started talking to the Democrats at the beginning of the session. This is the idea. Engaged them in the Assembly and over in the Senate, and then even went to the governor's office and said, okay, what are the red lines in the sand here that you are not going to like in this bill? because there are certain things that we need to get done and certain things that you will probably veto they are going to cost us the good things they need to get done. Mm. So the governor's office actually gave us their ideas, right? And I, I don't think that happens very often where the legislature reaches out to the executive branch saying, hey, just let us know what too far is so we don't cross it and waste all this time. So engaging in those conversations at all those different levels, getting all the stakeholders and county clerks and municipal clerks and yeah, everybody to the table to say, okay, this is what we need, this is what we think, this is what you think, let's find this middle ground. It made a bill that went through on a voice vote in the state assembly. Uh, so it's just it's an amazing, amazing uh, process to, to get something that significant done with that little heartburn from anybody else. It really speaks to what we can do when we um, can put things aside and work together and reach across the aisle. Yeah, I mean, it's just, and even beyond the bill, it's just the friendships that we get to build amongst committee members. I mean, I, I've i got, you know, six Republicans on the committee and three Democrats. Uh, and to be honest, I only knew one of the Democrats really well before that because she was on uh, another committee I chaired last session. But I've got to meet these other two members on their side of the aisle, quote unquote, and got to become really good friends that we text and talk and hang out. And I mean, it's just, Building those relationships has been even a, a, a bigger thing to me than just getting some of these bills done is because it's it's important that, you know, how you treat people instead of, you know, getting your stuff done and being the most important person in the room. You know, Scott, uh, I was uh, doing uh, some uh, uh, kind of work with Pam earlier, and we were talking about this, and uh, you and I have been talking about six or seven years now that we've been doing this, which I, it was uh, I, it really threw, I, it threw me for a second there. I did not realize oh. it's been that long. Uh, you, you poor, poor man. Um, <laughs> but when it, when it comes to that, what you're talking about right there, this is something we've been discussing since our first conversation, um, it, the, the importance of bipartisanism. Now, where we are now with this, I think that we have such an opportunity, not an opportunity, it's something that's actually happening in real time. Wisconsin is such an example to the rest of the union of a purple state and what can get done in a purple state. I think that's all the more reason why it's so vital going forward in a brand new year with new elections coming up to get away from the divisiveness and show so much more in, uh, of a connection. If you're running against somebody, you can stand on your own word. You don't have to trash talk them. Just do your own thing. I think we're seeing more and more of people wanting that out of their politicians, and hopefully we'll see more of that come election season. We'll touch actually a little bit more on campaigns in a moment. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I've decided to, from my first campaign on. My wife has always told me that I'm not going to do that or she's not going to support any more of my efforts to run. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an easy choice for me to, to take yeah, that yeah. path. Because I, I literally, I don't even ever mention my opponent's name when I'm running. I don't need to. I, I, can, I can work on the, I can pitch people on what I've accomplished and the ideas that I have coming up. So it, it's just. It's so much easier, and this, and I, and I've actually branded this thing that we've been doing at the Capitol with this bipartisan push, calling it a new way forward. We just, it's spreading to other committees in the assembly to say, okay, why don't you sit down with your members on the other side, figure out what's going to work, get it moved forward, get it to the governor's desk, let's get these things done. So it's, it has been great to to swim against the tide, so to speak, and mm -hmm. actually accomplish a lot of this stuff.
Um, uh, Scott, I mentioned campaign season, and it seems like it's right around the corner. And, and really, it, I was joking actually on the air earlier about this. I, it's a little like the NFL where there is no off season anymore. It, it's, yeah. it, politics is kind of like that, where it always there's always it seems like it's always campaign time. Um, with that being said, a bipartisan group of Wisconsin lawmakers is circulating a bill that will require candidates and political groups to tell the public when they use artificial intelligence to generate audio or video in their ads. Scott, I can't think of anything that's there's two parts to this for me. One, how important you think this is. And, and and two, how ridiculous is this that we need a bill for this? Um, that uh, it, it, that we're at this point in in po- the political game that that uh, for one that people might not be able to tell a difference, and, and that two that we actually have to worry about this kind of stuff. We've got a, so much on our plate already as a society to worry about. Now we have this kind of thing. How important is this bill to you? So this is really actually the top thing I need to get done yet this session. So back in, I think it was March, I had a reporter call me from New York Times or Washington Post or something or other talking about, you know, campaigns in Wisconsin and how close our elections always are. And I didn't really have much that I could tell her besides, you know, what I'm going to tell you on artificial intelligence because she asked, well, what about these deep fakes? Other states are are dealing with this. I'm like, I don't know we haven't even thought about it here in wisconsin so we started researching a little bit and seeing what other states were doing like washington state in particular and some of the east coast states where it actually had become a real problem and it had kind of escaped me that ai is growing so rapidly that there's applications and campaigns and elections and how we process information so i appointed a couple of members of our committee uh, to take on the issue. So the bill is set. It's going to come to campaigns and elections in January. They were going to have hearings based on the work that the Speaker's Task Force and Artificial Intelligence also worked on. Uh, so it became a huge issue right after this reporter called to say, okay, well, yeah, we better think about this a little bit because, yeah, it's it's real. AI is taking, you know, it technologically advancing more than anything else in our society. So we've We've got to start figuring it out. So putting some disclaimers on some some things that are fake is just a good safeguard to make sure people consume the right information. You mentioned, uh, actually, uh, unintentionally or not, that was a good way of uh, giving a tip of the hat to journalism and how much we still need journalism. Um, Yeah, right. But also, um, with uh, talking about this, and I know it's a new topic with you and your colleagues, but talking about it with them, do you see kind of like a a 100 percent everybody kind of agreeing with, yeah, we got to get this done? Yeah, it was. As soon as we appointed a couple of members to work on this issue, they came together pretty darn quick on what would work and what are the guide rails. And, you know, we've got some pretty young bucks in the assembly right now. I call them our our millennial legislators who are all over this. I mean, there's a good group of a dozen or so of these uh, men and women who are a lot more technologically savvy than I can even say I am at this point, who knew exactly who to go to and talk to and and, you know, the technology industries, and, I mean, they've done a great job on vetting this out. So it was pretty well agreed on pretty quickly. We are speaking with Representative Scott Krug right now. And, and Scott, I wanted to get into this one with you as well. You testified uh, last month in front of the Senate Committee on Transportation and Local Government, along with uh, Mick Ferkey. I apologize if I don't get that name right. Um, Mick and you, in support of SB 230, this bill is an effort to endorsed by RV dealers, RV manufacturers, to prove and clarify Wisconsin's laws within the rapidly growing RV industry. Uh, another one of those topics where I don't, it feels like it could slip through the cracks, but it's one of those ones we got to get figured out as well. Yeah, I mean, Mick and I have been working on this bill for six, maybe seven years now. It was such a big issue in the RV industry, and obviously if you drive down Highway 13 in Wisconsin Rapids, you know we're one of the epicenters for RV dealers yeah, in yeah. the state of Wisconsin. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's such a growing industry because of COVID and mm-hmm. all the things that people could do to get away and get you know some space from each other. And so RV and camping have become absolutely huge. So we've got these huge manufacturers out in Indiana and other parts of the country who deal with these dealers who are all mostly Wisconsin-based. And there's these disagreements on franchises and, and how you know their process works in, under Wisconsin law. So there's a lot of technical things in the bill, but basically what it does is it gives these dealers locally some certainty in contracts with manufacturers. So manufacturers can't just willy-nilly pull their agreements, you know, especially like for Mick when he was transferring the business to his son. 
the manufacturer basically said, well, we don't know your son, so we're going to pull our line from you. Well, I mean, that destroys somebody's business just because of a succession plan. So we, we you know, Mick actually worked on uh, creating an entire lobbying group to, to pull this together to get RV dealers from across the state of Wisconsin to work together to come up with guidelines that will work. Uh, it's a bipartisan bill. It's flying through the Assembly and the Senate pretty quickly, uh, working with the DOT to get some language things done that are going to make some sense, too. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's a big deal for a lot of businesses in the Rapids area to make sure we've got some certainty with their manufacturers that they can conduct business as they need to and not just at the manufacturer's whim. Certainly has a trickle-down effect, too. Uh, it's a part. It's a ba- big part of our economy, especially, as you mentioned, here in central Wisconsin. Um, and the idea of so many people that do come to this state without an RV looking to buy one and then travel the state, you know, visiting it and, and you, you know, spending the dollars and up and down the state uh, doing that as well. It's an important one to get figured out on that level. Yeah, and it just it really speaks again to how you know the best bills originate. I mean, this this is organic, right? This is generated from a problem that was seen, you know, back home that a constituent raised and said, "Hey, can you help me with this?" That we start vetting through the process, working with the Department of Transportation and other groups. And I mean, it's just it is exactly the the best type of bill. It's homegrown, organic type stuff. Hmm. I'm curious. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how that uh, unfolds, uh, Scott. We got about uh, you know seven, eight minutes left. Um, I, I want to get into a couple more things with you real quick. But one of the ones I wanted to touch on with you last month, when it may have been a little more, um, <laughs> a little more topical, but recently our our, our friend, yours and mine, uh, Wisconsin Rapids Mayor Shane Blazer, announced that he would not be seeking a third term. Um, Shane joined us on the air with that news and kind of broke it for our audience, and we got talking about it. And you know, Shane, he is not. Uh, um, he's not going to put on airs. You ask him a question, yeah. he's going to give you a genuine answer. And so when I asked him why, he was very real about it. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the negativity out there and a lot of the keyboard cowards and a lot of these things. Uh, no mayor in any town, I don't care how big or how small, should have to deal with death threats. No politician should have to deal with death threats. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you were Henry Kissinger or the most divisive uh, politicians ever. I don't care who you are. Yeah. Nobody deserves that. But here we're losing a great, a great politician a great uh, man in this area because of these situations. You don't know who's going to fill that spot. Um, You yourself have touched on this a little bit over the years. You see something like this go on with somebody that you're you're friendly with, you know pretty well. Does it make you think about these things at all? You know, I I think about it all the time, right? I mean, there's always an exit strategy at some point (laughs) in how you leave and when you leave and why you leave. And I think you know, everybody's got their own reasons, and I think it's the you know a good time for Shane to reevaluate and do what he wants. And he's been an amazing mayor, and mm-hmm. I I don't take anything away from him. I mean, one of the reasons, if if and when I do leave, I think the last reason I would ever do is because of negativity. I you know you and I talk about it all the time mm-hmm. that I always try to. That's why I'm there, right? Mm-hmm. Is to fight the negativity and the. You know, whether I get bills done or not, I want to leave it a better place than, than I inherited it from. And uh, I don't think I, I, will, I don't know if I would ever get to that point where I would leave because of that. I think I would, I, I always say I've got a book of stuff, right? Yeah. And as soon as my book of stuff kind of gets, starts getting emptier than fuller, then it's time to go. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Shane's been great, but I'm, I'm always the kind of guy that's going to stand up and punch a bully in the nose before I let him <laughs> Right up. You know, that's what I'm going to do. But yeah, I, I I was shocked when he decided to go. I think he's done an amazing job and led the city through some really tough times here with the mill closing and you know trying to find options for people to to stay and live and work and play in Rapids. He's he's just been a godsend. So I'm looking forward to the next person reaching out and telling us why they're going to be the best choice and helping vet somebody to to fill those shoes because it's a really important thing to me growing up in Rapids that we have a solid mayor like Shane Blazer was. Yeah, agreed. Uh, agreed tenfold. Um, you uh, recently had the Christmas tree show up at the Capitol. That was pretty exciting. Yeah, it's always cool. I mean, that's, the, that's one of the best times of the year is now that the tree is getting decorated, getting folks down there to see it. I mean, it's always a great story, too, where the trees always come from. I always was like, like listening to the, some of these stories. And this one was literally plucked out of somebody's front yard. It's not like a tree farm tree or anything. This is literally the tree picked out of somebody's front yard in Rhinelander that's made its way to the Capitol Rotunda. So it's <laughs> it's just it's a it's a great thing to to see this tree get put up and 
spread out and how they trim it and how they support it. I mean, it's just it's such a huge process to get that thing in there and you know, and get it all set up. So I, you know, I would highly encourage if you haven't seen it at the Capitol during the holiday season to get down there before Christmas and uh, you know check it out because it's it's something to behold. It is beautiful. The pictures are wonderful. Encourage people to check those out. And if you can get to Madison, check it out in person. Even better. Head on down there. Never a bad time to head to Madison. Um, yeah. Scott, we, we've done our job. We did it. We were professional. Now we can talk a little sports. Uh, we have not gotten to talk about the uh, change at manager for the Milwaukee Brewers. How you feeling? Mm-hmm. How you feel? I just wanted to check in well, on I, it. How you feel? feeling? Right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I, I, I was always a big wrestling fan growing up as a kid, right? And mm-hmm. I always said, one of the coolest things in wrestling was Hulk Hogan's heel turn when he went to the WCW and <laughs> got to the NWO going, right? So this, yeah. this Frank Dowdsville thing is so NWO. It's just, how, do, how, do you, how do you see that coming? So, I, mean, I kind of look forward to seeing Council come to Milwaukee 18 times next year to get mm-hmm. moved. So. Mm-hmm. Do you think, uh, it, 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 in, all, in, all, in, in somewhat seriousness, we're, only, we're talking sports, you can't get too serious about it, but when it, when it comes to that, do you think that this is going to light a fire under the ownership of the Milwaukee Brewers? Because I have heard rumors that they are looking to spend money this offseason. Well, that's what they just did, I think, yesterday. They're looking to finalize an $80 million contract with a minor leaguer. Yeah, you know, they're, yeah. they're finally taking that money out of the, the managerial spot and putting it back into the players. So I think that helps. Uh, you know, Pat Murphy's going to be a solid guy. He was, he's been there the whole time with council. So, I mean, you don't need a superstar to manage a team. Look at Mike Schilt when he managed the Cardinals now getting hired by San Diego. I mean, you can find some guys who don't need to make 8 million a year to, yeah. to manage the team and spend it on the field. So I think it's going to be exciting. I mean, as long as they figure out what they're going to do with the Dallas and Burns, if they're going to keep them or trade them, I mean, you know, that's kind of the last piece to see what their direction is going to be. If they send them off, obviously it's a rebuild, but if they, keep them i think they feel pretty good about their chances of getting back to the playoffs again so it looks like uh the manager in waiting is ricky weeks uh what do you how do you feel about that that one i'm not so huge on yet i mean you know we kind of always go through this thing in milwaukee where we got to have a hometown guy end up being the manager i mean it worked out great with council but it doesn't always work out when you try to force it so i'm glad they didn't put him in there right away Mm -hmm. and let him learn the ropes because he really hasn't managed anywhere else but it's always cool to see hometown guys but you kind of got to be careful sometimes being that big of a homer to try to make sure you're going to win a world series you got to got to find the right person not just the the person from home yeah you look at a couple of organizations that have done that over the years not gone very well for them so um, well, I mean, you, know, you know david ross you know the cubs situation, oh sure I yeah thought- I thought it would have been a great trade. Just bring Rossi up here. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought he was a perfectly fine manager. So I, I, if I was a Brewer fan, I would have been all right with that too. Um, I, I did want to ask about one other thing when it comes to the Milwaukee Brewers. Now that it has been settled and uh, the Brewers aren't going anywhere, not that we necessarily thought they were, but it's official and they, the contract is signed, uh, the team is staying. Do you think that there's any talk of turning the Milwaukee area a little bit like Wrigleyville, a little bit like what Jones did? After the Ricketts did that in Wrigleyville, everybody picked up and started doing it. In Dallas, they've done a similar thing with the Cowboys. Do you think that you could see, certainly maybe not to that extent, but some level of that with the Brewers? Well, that's what we kind of laid out for them during this legislative process on the bill, saying, hey, you kind of need to start thinking about some of these things like that. You know, like like Green Bay's now a title town, you Mm -hmm. know, just... You know, like the Bucks have done with the Bucks district. You know, just you know, let's try to make this a little more family friendly, user friendly. I mean, it's always a great tradition. I love tailgating on the parking lot at, at a Brewers game, but it's got to be more. So, I mean, it was nice when they added the Little League Stadium out there, and if they can find ways to improve that area, because honestly, for stadiums across the nation, you know, Amfam Field or Miller Park, whatever you want to call it, is literally the only one that I know of that is in the absolute middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's surrounded by concrete highways everywhere, so you kind of got to figure out a way to start making it a little more user-friendly all around on the outside. So hopefully they they just bought a couple of acres on the outskirts and they'll start developing it a little bit better and more and give us a a little more entertainment value for folks who don't want to just sit in the parking lot and cook some brats and drink some beer. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Not at all. <laughs> Nothing wrong at all with that. Uh, <laughs> we're looking forward to it come spring. Scott, uh, always good talking with you. If people have follow-up questions, want to know more, how can they get uh, in touch with you? Yeah, it's worked out great. That when we do this, I give out the phone number, 715-323-3293, and we literally do have people calling as soon as you know the show gets over. So mm-hmm. I, I encourage you. I, I leave some time open after... 
after we get off the air, and it, mm-hmm. it works out pretty good for people to call with questions. Really good to hear. Uh, have a great ho- set of holidays, you and yours. Uh, looking forward to talking to you in the new year. Absolutely. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care, Scott. And we'll have more Midday Magazine for you coming up right here on WFHR, locally grown radio.